professor in the Department of Human Dimensions of Natural Resources. And this is our first kickoff talk, so our inaugural talk, if you will, um, in the series called Human Wildlife Interactions. And this is a um, series that's being jointly sponsored by our department, Human Dimensions of Natural Resources, and also the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. And I'll just quickly recognize the committee members um, that have served with me on selecting the speakers to come in for the series. So Dr. Kevin Crooks, who's here from Wildlife Program, um, and Dr. Joel Berger, who isn't here today, unfortunately, and Dr. Jerry Basil from our department. Um, and so what we're hoping for with this series is to be able to not only bring in some exciting speakers, um, but also to enhance opportunities for collaboration across our departments and beyond in thinking about ways that we can bring social and ecological science together and tackle some important conservation problems. So I'm really excited that our first speaker is Dr. Amy Dickman. And Amy joins us from Oxford. She's currently the Kaplan Senior Research Fellow in Felid Conservation there. Um, she has 20 years of experience working on large carnivores in Africa, specializing in human carnivore conflict. She has a master's degree from Oxford and a PhD from University College London, and has published over 60 scientific papers and book chapters on large carnivore ecology and conservation. Uh, she's also a member of several IUCN working groups and task forces working on big cat and human wildlife conflict issues and is a National Geographic explorer. She's also won a number of awards for her work. Um, what she's going to be talking about specifically today is her work in Tanzania. Um, in 2009, she established the Ruaha Carnivore Project, and I have to say it's really a great example of a conservation success story, bringing together ecological science and working with local communities. Um, just as an example, and I know she'll talk more about this in her talk, um, but since they've been working there since 2011, um, carnivore attacks on livestock in the area have been reduced by over 60%, and lion killings have been reduced by over 80%. And Amy's working now on trying to scale up and look at ways to expand this work in other areas to benefit both large carnivores and local communities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Tara, and thank you all for having me here today. It's very nice to be in Colorado. I was doubting that you had any mountains up until this morning, but I see they have arrived. Um, anyway, it's really good to be here, and yeah, I'm going to talk about my work in Ruaha. We do a lot of ecological work there as well, predominantly camera trapping, uh, satellite collaring, but for today, because it's human-wildlife interactions, I'm focusing particularly on the conflict work. But if people want to talk more about the ecological work, then feel free to come up to me and we can chat more about that later. So it is no surprise to any of you, I'm very much talking to the converted when I say that large carnivores are extremely important across the world. They have great economic value in the range countries in which they occur, uh, which these are often very poor countries economically. So particularly things like photographic tourism or trophy hunting, as contentious as it may be, and we'll get on to that later. And also they have really important ecological value, obviously, as top apex carnivores in the systems, regulating prey, regulating mesocarnival populations, etc. And they also have really significant existence value. People across the world just like to know they live in a world with lions and tigers and bears roaming out there, even if they never get to see them, and sometimes particularly if they never get to see them. <laughs> so what we'll be going through today is a uh, about sort of probably about 35 minutes on the project and then talking for maybe 10 minutes about bigger research questions and some stuff that it might be useful or opportunities to think about over lunch discussion points and maybe kick off ideas for collaborations as well. So despite the importance of large carnivores, they are under huge threat. So for instance, cheetahs have disappeared from over 90% of their historic range. Even species like leopards, which are generally considered to be very ubiquitous across Africa, their numbers have dramatically declined. We have no idea really how many, but certainly undergone a massive contraction in numbers. And even a species like the lion, which is incredibly iconic, has really declined. And we have been very bad in getting across the point that there are now as few wild lions left in Africa as rhinos. So people need to sort of recognise that these apex carnivores are vulnerable, particularly to anthropogenic pressures. If you look at lions for a minute, that's our main focal species. This was the range map in 2006. Six. So the sort of mid-brown colour here, I don't know if there's a laser pointer, let me see. Yeah, the mid-brown colour here shows the historic range and these darkish red patches show the estimated range in 2006. And the estimated population then was somewhere around 35,000 lions. 
We're just in the middle of doing the latest analysis of lion populations, and this is our sort of best guess at present. Now, that doesn't reflect that amount of decline necessarily in the last 12 years, but it, in some cases it is increased knowledge and better knowledge of those populations, but it does show there's been a massive decline in historic range. So we think that lions have disappeared from around 90% of the historic range. There are somewhere around 24,000 wild lions left. Uh, a lot of the small fenced South African populations aren't included in this. Half of those remaining populations, which is very concerning, have 50 or fewer individuals. So they're very unlikely to be uh, persisting in the long term. And there are only six populations left that have at least 1,000 individuals in them. So these are major issues that we've got to look at with lion populations. The darker blue here represent the biggest populations left. And the main threats driving these declines are loss of habitat, loss of prey, particularly with bushmeat snaring, as people snare bushmeat for protein, and conflict with people. If you look at the most important country for lions, it is undoubtedly Tanzania. It has around 40% of the world's lions. And Ruaha, right in the heart of Tanzania, has close to 10% of the world's remaining lion populations. So these are fundamentally important populations to work with. Ruaha is a really vital as a global hotspot for a whole suite of large carnivores. Uh, it has the third biggest population of endangered African wild dogs left, and one of only six thought to be viable in the long term. It has globally important populations of cheetahs, and very important populations of leopards and uh, spotted hyenas as well. But interestingly, when you look across the landscape, it is centered around the Ruaha National Park, which is about 8,000 square miles, I believe, 20, just over 20,000 square kilometers. And it's unfenced, and that then goes into a bigger landscape of about the same size that is mainly on hunting reserves. So it looks like this, you've got the park down here, you've got these big hunting reserves, game reserves to the north, and then you've got village land down here. These are wildlife management areas which are part of the village land. So this is an unfenced, massive landscape, and it looks, you would imagine it may be relatively secure because of its very size. And while that's obviously hugely important, our ecological data from camera trapping and from collaring and spore counts has looked at the fact that actually, if you look at the high density zones, particularly for lions, they are right at the edges of the park. So most of the park is actually low density for lions. The most important area in particular is this bit that overlaps the village land in particular. So lions rely heavily across the landscape on these human dominated lands. And there they overlap extensively with extremely poor subsistence farmers and, and pastoralists. And when we talk about them being poor, they are extremely poor, 90% of them live on less than $2 a day and 60% of them live on less than a dollar a day. Because of that, 45% of people are undernourished. Two thirds of people have no access to clean water or any form of improved sanitation. So diseases like cholera and giardia are endemic. Half of the local households are unable to meet their daily food needs. So food insecurity is a massive issue. And there's little access to medical care, certainly Western medical care, and their life expectancy is around 50 years old. So these people are living really on the edge. And when you look at the ability for them to get out of these poverty traps, they are very restricted, particularly by things like poor literacy. If you look at household heads, who are meant to be the, obviously the most empowered, a quarter of male household heads have not even any basic literacy. And that's true for 75% of women have no basic literacy at all. And that means that poverty restricts their future options. They're very un unlikely to be able to get out of these situations in the current state. And then you put alongside the fact that they are living cheek by jowl with some of the world's most important carnival populations, which impose an additional cost on people. So this is very typical. This guy had three cattle, um, obviously really important both culturally and economically for these households, particularly with the Barabeg, we'll talk about them more in a minute, and the Maasai. He then unsurprisingly poisoned the carcass of the cow and killed three lions. So that's a very normal sort of conflict here. It obviously has major costs on both sides. So in 2009, I had done my master's and my PhD in this area, looking at what people said they felt about human carnival conflict. And everyone said, well, we don't like carnivores. You know, they're kind of a pain, but we don't kill them. I thought, well, it seems unlikely. I would kill them if I was you. Um, and so we thought we'd set up the project under this fellowship at Oxford to really live right within the communities there and see what was actually happening and how much of a conservation threat this conflict really was. So the first sort of task was to find a place to stay. We had been told that the Barabaig were likely to be sort of a key player in lion killing. 
and that we wanted and there's a t tribe living there and we wanted to live there for in a heavily Barabeg area. So this is a Barabeg village predominantly. It's called Katisi. It looks out towards the national park, which as I said, is unfenced. So we picked this as our campsite. We set up the field camp. It took about 20 minutes. Um, it was fine. There were three of us, myself and two Tanzanians. Uh, it was all good, apart from the fact that we discovered a bit later there's a leopard that lived in this bush here. And so it was fine. We had a timeshare. She had the night, we had the day. All good, as long as you didn't need to pee in the middle of the night. So we set up a kitchen. Uh, this is still our kitchen today, uh, even though now it has tables. We're very excited by that. Uh, and bathrooms. So this is my ensuite, just down from my tent. So it has the bucket shower which is delightfully cold when it's cold and hot when it's hot, as everyone knows who's used them. And then we had the first concrete in camp, which was really critical, was the toilet, um, which was wonderful. We were pretty pleased with our construction skills until we had a tragic toilet accident, I have to say, while I was on it, and the whole thing collapsed. And after extricating myself from the toilet and managing to get back, I said to the guys, what the hell's going on? They said, oh, Amy, they said, do you know how many people die like this in Tanzania? I was like, no. <laughs> But you do? Why are we building them like this? So now we've reinforced it with like enough concrete you could drive a truck over, but it still gives you a frisson on every time you use it. This is the Project HQ. This is my tent. Um, and really the aim of being right out there in the village was trying to understand how much lion killing was really going on. And it turns out there was a huge amount of carnivore killing. So this was just the initial sort of year or so that we were out there. We had over 37 lions killed in 18 months just around this small village, this village has less than 50 households in it. And so there was a sh massive scale of lion killing. And a lot of these, we literally would just be walking in the bush and you'd smell a carcass and you'd go and find these carcasses out in the bush. And the two things jumped out to us, in addition to the sheer volume of lion killing and other carnival killing, but predominantly lions, was that the first thing was that an awful lot of the lions were missing their right front paw. The rest of the carcass was often intact, but that was missing. We had no idea why. And secondly, the other thing that jumped out of us was that an awful lot of the animals we were seeing, particularly those that were poisoned, were heavily pregnant females. So you would go to them, you would cut them open, and they would have three or four cubs ready to be born. And there is no, obviously, no bigger way and better way of decimating a population than taking out the reproductively active females. So this was like to be having a massive impact, even on a population as big as Ruaha's, this kind of mortality around that edge was like to be having a huge impact. When we talked to people about it, and they said, you know, the people you've got to talk to are the Barabaig. Now, the Barabaig are a sister tribe to the Maasai. Interestingly, much as everyone knows the Maasai, no one's ever heard of the Barabaig. They come from the same Nilotic origins, but they differ in various ways. Most obviously, they traditionally wear black instead of red. They have a lot of sort of ornamentation they wear, and they're famed for being particularly secretive and particularly hostile. They do not engage with outsiders. Um, they are a pretty scary tribe, I have to say. Traditionally, in Barabaig culture, to prove bravery, you either have to kill a lion or traditionally you can kill a non-Barabeg person. We didn't know this when we turned up as being the only non-Barabeg people in the village. And it does sharpen your mind how much you actually care about lion conservation when you think you actually could be next as the substitute. So we thought, well, we'll deal with that later. And um, we tried all the traditional community things of trying to engage with them. We tried to have community meetings. We tried to go to their houses. We tried everything, none of it worked. You would go to the Bomas, their households, and, and you would find you know, a goat wandering around, a pot on the fire, and no one there. And they would just have run off and hidden in the bush. And we, literally after two years, we had all this killing, no contact with them whatsoever, really. And we thought, we're going to have to give up. It, maybe it's true, the Barabeg will never work with conservationists. Then we put up solar panels at camp to charge our laptops. And then the, ba then the Barabeg turned up to charge their mobile phones. And it still kills me to this day that I didn't think of this earlier because obviously any one of us in the bush, the last thing we're going to give up is our mobile phones. And it's the same for the Barabeg. They use them for everything from checking livestock prices to telling people if a child's gone missing in the bush or if they're missing livestock. So it wasn't like an immediate, you know, hallelujah moment, but they started coming. Uh, they would just look at some of our materials. Obviously, most of them couldn't read it, but they would look at the pictures. They would just be observing us and sort of trying to get to know it us sort of like this weird foreign species from afar. So after a while of that and after a terrifying incident, I have to say, in the bush one night when we went up, we were sitting at our camp and we heard what was clearly the celebrations for a lion kill happening up on the hills. And we thought, oh, let's just go and talk to them and see if we can actually, you know, use some kind of 
connection with them and we walked up through the bush, the three of us at night, very dark night, moonlit but cloudy. And as we were sort of halfway up to the household, we stopped and all three of us literally had our, this sort of, the hairs standing up on the back of your neck and we thought, oh, there's something wrong. And I thought, what is it? Is it a lion? Is it a hyena? There's some danger here. And as the clouds parted and this moonlight came down, we were entirely surrounded by these warriors with their spears up. And then the clouds went back and I thought, oh my God, this, we're gonna die, this is it. But thank God we were, they sort of listened to us. This main warrior, Shabani, came forward. We explained that we were trying to do research and just trying to talk to them. And uh, he thought we were crazy. He said, you know, we could have killed you, but he said, if you're that crazy, we'll come and we'll meet you at the camp. And so they just came down for a meeting with us, which was wonderful. We got to sit with them for the first time and really said, look, this is what we do. We are not trying to get you into trouble. We are not the wildlife division. We're not the police. We're not the government. All we're trying to do is understand why you kill so many lions and carnivores. And then is there a way that we could achieve whatever you're achieving through it in a different way? And so they seemed all very happy with that, um, mainly because we had loads of banana wine that they'd bought, which is horrible, but very, very effective at sort of facilitating open conversations. And so after that, they were like, right, this is great. And that night, it was the highlight, I swear, of the whole sort of project to date, because we just really felt that this was our breakthrough with the Barabay. You know, no one said we could do it, but we'd finally done it. We were going to have a great time going forward. Within about four days, that same group of warriors went out and killed seven lions around our camp. And this was our lowest point. Our guys were in tears at the carcasses. It was really, really depressing. And I called up Leela Hazar, who runs Lion Guardians, who many of you will know, a good friend of mine. And I said, Leela, I can't do it. I cannot work with these people. And she said, this is a test. She said, I have had to watch people spear lions in front of me and do nothing. She said, they are seeing whether you're on their side or you're going to create massive issues for them over this. She said, you just have to stand back and do nothing. So we did nothing. They knew we knew about them. And sure enough, within a week or so, they came down. They said to us, come to our tribal meeting and then we'll really talk. So we were the first outsiders at these traditional meetings, certainly the first Westerners. And it was a really good opportunity to actually talk to them about what all the reasons they were killing carnivores and how we might be able to sort of move forward together. And there were sort of five key reasons that they had. The first one and the most obvious one is attacks on their livestock. So the attacks were significant. They were costing people about 18% of their annual income. So none of us would put up with that. They also had very few benefits to do with conservation and wildlife presence. And the very few benefits there were were inequitably distributed. So the people who were having the costs were not those who were getting the benefits. There were only a few people in one village right by the park boundary who were getting the benefits, which seemed to consist only of selling alcohol to the park rangers. Um, but really importantly, and probably the most important thing we got from them working with the warriors was these issues, these cultural issues. So they explained that the killing of lions was really important because when you kill a lion, the guy that throws the first spear that hits the lion gets to cut off the right front paw and takes this central claw. And that claw is used, he, they wear it as a, as a sort of amulet on their arm here. They go to the witch doctor. The witch doctor tells them how many livestock, how many households, sorry, they can go to to get gifts of cattle from as a reward for killing lions and protecting the community. So this was the only way the young men explained that they could get wealth effectively, cattle. Um, they could also get status through it because the women um, would give them attention and critically the women would sleep with them after they'd been out to go and kill a lion. So it was what drives human behavior the whole world over, money and sex. And it was just understanding those drivers was really important for thinking about how we might try and work with them going forward. There were also myths about man-eating. Unfortunately, man-eating is quite an issue down in southern Tanzania. And this is a guy that we ended up uh, sort of trying to patch up at camp and after a lion attack. But when it's interesting that when people, when people have livestock attacked, they blame lions, they blame the carnivores. When they have people attacked, they don't tend to blame the lions. They tend to blame other tribes. They believe that other tribes use witchcraft to switch spirit lions into attacking you or your family because it's sort of revenge for some sort of intertribal conflict. So what it reflects is not, in this case, antagonism towards lions. It tends to represent antagonism between the tribes and lack of communication because they all believe it's only happening to them because they don't discuss it. There's also a lack of conservation awareness. People just, if they've obviously never moved anywhere beyond the 10 kilometers where they live, then they don't know why on earth anyone would care about lions or other carnivores, why Roaha is so important for these species, and why on earth you know, they don't get the sense they're declining in the way that we do from a global perspective. So then we knew all of this stuff. We had no idea how to deal with any of it. Um, apart from the only thing really we did have a clue how to do was how to potentially stop livestock, carnivore attacks on livestock. 
And so the first thing we did was work with them to reduce attacks by predator-proofing their livestock enclosures. This is a traditional livestock enclosure. Um, I mean, I could jump over that, frankly. So it's not exactly daunting for a carnivore. So we work with them on a cost-sharing basis. We pay 75 cents of the cost. They pay 25% and we reinforce it with tall diamond mesh fencing. I mean, it doesn't look that great. If you went into a zoo and this was their lion enclosure, you would probably call somebody and say you weren't particularly happy about taking your kids there. But actually it works really well. If you put your livestock in, it stops about 95% of attacks. But the issue that we had is that if you stop nighttime attacks, all you might be doing is switching the problem by 12 hours and having more attacks in the day. So then we had to deal with daytime attacks as well. When I was in Namibia, I worked there for six years and we worked with Anatolian shepherd dogs. Now, it was interesting because when we talked to people about the use of dogs, there was zero interest in using dogs. And just people had dogs all around the place, but they never, they had no engagement with them. And it was only after a community meeting we had at the camp when our dogs, two village dogs, were getting in the way and we told them to sit in Swahili. And the whole meeting ground to a halt. And I said, what's wrong? And they said, where did you get the magic dogs? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, they're just, they're just normal dogs. And they said, they speak Swahili. I was like, well, no, they don't. I mean, they don't speak Swahili. I mean, I'm, usually, actually, we talk to them in English. They were like, they speak English? <laughs> I said, well, no, we're getting off the point. I mean, they're just normal dogs. And finally, I said to the guy who'd given me the dogs, you know, Mzee Panya, we got them off you. And he said, yeah, I would never have given you those two if I'd known they were magic. <laughs> and I was like, but it really opened this dialogue about the fact that dogs could be useful. They started coming and trying to train our dogs, which we've never succeeded in really doing. But finally, it opened the door that when we said dogs might be useful, they were a bit more open to it. We ended up bringing over 10 Anatolian Shepherd puppies from Namibia. It was the first trial of these dogs in East Africa. And they looked ridiculous. When you give them to someone, they're like, uh, have you ever seen a lion? They are massive. Um, but happily, these dogs grow to be very big, very impressive. The point is not that they fight the, lion, the lions. I'm sure you all know how these work. But obviously, with a guarding dog, the aim is they get between the predator and the herd. They don't move the prey away. But they just alert the fact the predator has been seen. There's no point trying to come and attack because they've lost that element of surprise. So it's been useful. It hasn't been flawless, but it's shown that it can work in East Africa and there's demand for it. So it's something we might, well, we are planning to do in the future, potentially crossbreeding them with village dogs because they are actually a bit big for people to look after for the first year at least. We also, to understand and reduce attacks properly, we need to understand lion movement. So last year we did the first satellite collaring of four lions um, to reveal where they were moving. And it was interesting because we, we were only allowed to collar lions in the park. And also it's pointless because they don't, they don't leave the park. And we were like, we're fairly sure they do. But you, this was a, one of the main females, one of the main prides. And sure enough, she hangs out along the river, but she would make these very rapid movements onto village land, probably cause some conflict, and then head straight back. So in the morning, she's sitting there looking all innocent. Um, and we were finding a lot of them doing this. They were clearly relying on village land. Moving across it, there's clearly a landscape of fear that they don't dawdle around. They go out there. They probably predate on something, they come straight back in again. But it was good to say to people, these, what you think are your park lions are also the village lions. So all this um, killing of lions on village land is gonna be affecting your park population. So it's been a really useful tool for that. And it also means we can engage the community in helping protect themselves against attacks. So we've had the warriors um, get engaged because these are geofence collars. So they send a text alert as soon as they cross the park boundary. This goes to the lion defenders that I'll talk more about. Those warriors get out there, they find exactly where the lions are, they warn people about their presence, they push the lions away from livestock and people. So it's a very active way of intervening. And we've now got, just got in last week, the collars for another 11 lions, so, and four spotted hyenas. So we're interested to see what data we will get from that. And certainly there's lots of ecological research we'll be doing on it. More importantly than reducing attacks, though, is providing community benefits. So we worked extensively with all the villagers, we got them to vote on which benefits they most wanted to see. And they, they had three priorities, education, veterinary medicine and healthcare. So we didn't have any money at the beginning at all. So we said, OK, for education, we are going to twin schools. So we got international schools in the UK, the US to twin with a village school. We've done 15 so far. They raise $500 a year and basically it just gives enough basic equipment so that they can start to get some semblance of education and literacy. Um, we also then want to look at secondary school education because, you know, whereas primary school is free, secondary is not. We've got a scholarship program where we do full scholarships through secondary school. We've done 36 of these now. And it's the only time we went against the community because we said we want half these scholarships to go for girls. And they said, nope, girls are a waste of time. They get pregnant, they get married. 
what's the point? And we said that all the data shows that every single year a girl spends in education, it has a massive positive and long-term impact. So we're going to do it. And it's interesting that now, sort of six years into this, there is a real push within the community for the girls to go. And we've seen this real change, that the girls' education is being valued far more than it was at the beginning. But when we set our exam for the students to go into the scholarships and to pick them, we found there was a real disconnect between the students in primary, in primary school. Many of them couldn't pass the secondary school exam. So we went back to the, to the teachers and said, look, what else is the problem? You've got the books now. What else is holding you back? And they said, the children can't, you know, are not eating anything. So they come in in the morning, they walk a long distance, they don't have any way to get food at school, there's no kitchen or facilities. So we ended up uh, developing a porridge project where we work with the women's collective locally, so we guarantee that we buy food from the women. They then are employed to cook it for the children. It's very simple porridge, boiled eggs and things, but it ensures that they get a daily meal and it encourages people to send their kids to school because they know that their kids will be fed. It has really changed the attendance at schools we found and the um, ability there. The schools we've worked in have gone from the bottom of the league table to the, within the top three spots. So it's really made a difference. That's feeding over 800 children every day at the moment. And we want to expand that further because it's probably the most valued community benefit that we do. Healthcare has been really important. We focus, we've equipped clinics. We focus particularly on maternal and neonatal health. So simple things like these umbilical clips. Every time I go back, I'm like, my, all my pockets are filled with umbilical clips. I'm a nightmare to sit by on the plane, but it's so important. Just, they were using things like, you know, old razors, old bits of cloth. So just doing these sorts of things to stop neonatal infection and to stop mortality was so important for the women, obviously, and the children. For veterinary benefits, um, there was a massive demand for these. We ended up having to tie it into the enclosure program. We said, right, you're going to pay to do your enclosure, but you will effectively get that money back in subsidised veterinary medicines because disease kills nine times as much livestock as, as depredation does. So hopefully we thought if we could reduce depredation, you might open the bandwidth for people being a bit more tolerant, even if they lose some, some livestock to carnivores. So we did all of that and we were feeling pretty happy with ourselves for about probably three, four years. And then we found out, unsurprisingly, that people were taking all the benefits and liked the project, but they were still killing the carnivores and killing the wildlife, because why wouldn't you? You know, you're going to do all you can. And so then we thought, well, we need to tie in these benefits to specifically to wildlife presence. At the same time, we were camera trapping across the landscape to try to get an idea of, you know, carnivore distribution. Um, and all the camera traps were being stolen because people were poaching and didn't want us to know what was going on. And so then we thought, right, we're doing this all wrong. So we shifted it around and we said to the communities, you are going to do the camera trapping. So now each village has camera traps. They are trained and employed in how to use them. And they put them out on their village land. There are a few basic rules about how they can put them. And every animal they get gets a certain number of points. So a dick dick will get you 1,000 points in your camera traps. Um, uh, any sort of primate will get you 1500 points. I have to say at the beginning, I wanted a basic one to five point scale, but I was deemed super cheap. So they wanted thousands of points for every animal. I tried to point out the, actual, the way we calculate it is relative, but I was overruled, fine. Um, so the points are every individual animal. So for this impala and a baboon, you get two and a half thousand points. We obviously are biased towards carnivores and we try to give more points for conflict causing species and more threatened species. So a, a spotted hyena will get you 10,000 points. It will also destroy your camera trap. Um, 15,000 points for a lion. And the top spot is 20,000 points for an African wild dog. So it is, as I said, per individual. So this spot from Mahoninga village got them 340,000 points of 17 wild dogs. And this has been a really interesting example because this used to be a complete hotspot for snaring and sometimes poisoning, and particularly because the wild dogs were known to go there. Now, because the village, it is like its most sacred place because they are winning every time in the benefits and basically the benefits the points translate into extra community benefits and they have now put in community rules that these are legally protected camera traps under village bylaws that no one can touch them and no one can also touch the water holes so it's really important to see them taking action to protect it this gets zero points <laughs> this is the cam this is the shot you will get wherever in the world you put camera traps young men and alcohol <laughs> so mine yeah that was fun but the points, as I said, generate additional healthcare, education and veterinary benefits. In short, we have groups of four villages. We do it every three months. We add up the points. The top scoring village gets about $2,000 of benefits. And then each of them gets some sort of 1,500, 1,000 or 500. Then they reset again. So everyone gets some benefits. But the more wildlife they have, the more benefits they get. And it's been recognized now by 
regional governments and local governments as being the main driver locally of community development. So it's really important to see that the presence of wildlife is directly empowering these people. And we've seen that people and women in particular are standing up and saying to the young men, we don't want you to go out and kill because this is what is driving the development of our, of our village. And we particularly at one point, we had a group of young men go out into the, to hunt and the, young, the women called more back, showing they had the power to do it. And they said to them, you are killing the very thing that is enabling us to give birth safely and to educate our children. So they find every one of those men that went on the hunt a cow. And they said, there's no more lion hunting in this village or elephant hunting. And there was a whole spat between the warriors and the elders. We couldn't have done any of that, but they took it on themselves to do it. And just seeing that the community own it and take it on was really important for us. It also enables people worldwide to get involved through citizen science. We've got a portal. Um, snapshot Ruaha that anyone can get involved and classify lots of images of, of grass often, but sometimes you will see wild animals. And they, behind the scenes, we get the points and that goes straight back into the community camera traffic. In terms of cultural issues for the money, the sex and the status, we worked with Leela extensively to set up the first Lion Guardians project outside Kenya. It's had all sorts of challenges working with a different group, but has been very successful. We've now had 17 warriors patrolling over 800 square kilometres. They pre directly prevented over 70 lion hunts. And this is really important because it's a culturally appropriate way of the warriors having their warrior role in the community. They are protecting the community because when the lions are around, they chase them away. People can call them if they've lost livestock, if they've lost a child in the bush. They get wealth because they get paid every month so they can go and buy cattle. And they get status. We said, how else are you going to get status? That's the hardest thing for us to replicate. And they said, by learning to read or write because no one can do it. And so we said, fine, we've got literacy classes. They are now literate and numerate. They are trained in things like GPS use, satellite collars. Every year they go to Kenya and visit Leela's project. They have passports. They are the guys. So it's interesting that we have, we have sort of really changed their lives. And then we talked about the fact that how do you get the sex? Yeah, that was important for you earlier. And so now we do conservation dancing events because they used to have a dancing event when they killed a lion. We said, what if we fund a dancing event in a village every month if... There's no lion killing. And would you come, would that be the same? And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. So we sponsor it all. We put on the, we talk a little bit about the project. Then we let some music go on. We walk away, whatever happens, happens. And it's ridiculous. It's like match.com in the bush or Tinder or something now, but, but I don't care if that's what it takes, then that's what we're doing. Um, and it's really important. It's funny because now the women in particular say that the lion defenders are desired as husbands rather than the lion killers. So it's a real shift in that community. In terms of man-eating myths, we had no idea how to deal with it until the FIFA World Cup came and we realised the one thing that brings all young men together, regardless of tribe, is football. So we started facilitating intertribal groups and we don't talk much about, about conservation at all. We just enable them to connect and to bond together over something else. And then when a man-eating event does occur, they realise it isn't just that it's happening to the Maasai or the Barabeg or the Hey Hey, it's happening to all of them in different times and it, it isn't necessarily about intertribal stuff, it's about the fact this guy was totally drunk and walking back from the pub because that's when most of the attacks actually tend to happen. In terms of improving conservation awareness, we do a lot of this locally, we show DVD nights, um, we're just, I've got wildly infuriated with the fact that we have amazing films, you look at Disney, you look at National Geographic, BBC, incredible wildlife films about lions, and they're all in English, which makes it a very a big barrier to these communities and very clearly gives the message, this is not for you. This message isn't for you. We've talked endlessly to all of those and said, you need to do it in Swahili. It seems insanely hard to do. So we have now just engaged a National Geographic photographer and filmmaker to come out and interview these people to talk about the programmes, take amazing shots of wildlife and make a really compelling film showing those voices and showing what we're doing so that they see their voices represented and we want it to be across East Africa and with film festivals and things so that they really feel some ownership and some pride in this. Also you've got to be able to have people experience wildlife in a positive way so we've taken over a thousand people into the park and this is so important I mean the number one thing we hear when people come back from the park was I didn't know lions could be gentle. And I think God it, you are never going to save lions if you only see them attacking your stock you're never going to save elephants if you only see them you know, attacking your crops. So this was all really important. And also we've seen that it definitely improves their attitudes. Over 90% say it improves their attitudes. Um, and it's just that engagement of starting to look at wildlife in a different way with more empathy. We also, with conservation awareness this year, we're starting to do a book uh, in local languages with the main character is this Barabeg young boy. And it obviously talks about lion conflict in the project, but having the Barabeg represented in a book and having them have that sort of 
status is something that hasn't happened before. So we'll have it in Barabeg and Mar and Swahili, and we'll have it again, hopefully quite widely across East Africa and in the UK and US because it's going to have an English version as well. So we're excited about that. And we really focus a lot on building Tanzanian capacity. So the team is over 70 people now, um, and 95% of those are local Tanzanians. So, and we are constantly trying to make sure that each staff member goes from whatever level they are to the next level of education, whether that's primary school or from an undergraduate up to a degree. Each year we try to take people over to Oxford and do an international diploma in wildlife conservation so that people are becoming conservation leaders. As um, Tara said at the beginning, we've had really good impacts in the core area. This is, you know, we only have good data in about three villages. The depredation compared to when we got decent data in 2011, it was reduced by over 60%. And the carnival killing has been reduced by over 80% in those areas. We've now expanded our work to over 16 villages. So there's more killing that we have to deal with each year. But I think per square kilometre, it's going down quite substantially. And we really, it has changed from these people that, you know, people used to see us and run away to really being seen as a valued part of the local community. You know, they do see that they think we are there, you know, long term. We've been there through all sorts of nonsense that's gone on and we still just stay there and work with them. So I think that trust, that long term relationship has been fundamentally important for them recognising that we are trying to do conservation in a way that benefits them. But we need to do a lot more. Time is not on our side. We need to scale up in Ruaha. We want to work across all the 24 villages that are in our local area and we're getting constant calls from other sides of the park and other places in Tanzania as well. So we need to scale what we're doing in Ruaha and beyond it elsewhere in Tanzania, but also across Lion Range. And this is where a whole group of us who have talked a lot, similar sort of conservationists have said, this is a nightmare. Each time we start in a new place, it feels like we're starting again. And then each time a new group starts, they're having to learn all these things from scratch. So there needs to be a better way and actually a group of six of us who run lion conservation projects across East Africa joined together. And we said, let's actually work collectively together. Let's fundraise together. Let's share all our successes and failures so we're not competing against each other. Because otherwise, if I have a good idea, which is unlikely, but if I did, then I am not going to want to share it with Leela because we're going for the same grants. And that's a ridiculous model of conservation. We have to say, we're sharing this. And if we are going to go for funding. We have to say to funders, we are stronger together and hope that model is going to persist because it's the only way we're going to be able to do this stuff at scale. So we formed the Pride Lion Conservation Alliance. And it's been really useful just for helping us connect and strengthen our operations and programs at, at these big scales. We also are really pleased to have a collaboration with here with Colorado State on particularly on women's leadership through the Pathways uh, Initiative. And that's going to be launching next year in Kenya. So we're really excited about that. It's particularly focused at empowering the next level, that sort of mid-level of, at the moment, African conservation leaders and trying to make sure that we all work together so that we empower that next generation and make sure that you give people the tools they need to succeed in conservation. And I think this project really shows this, the importance of incorporating social science, not that I've shown you any science whatsoever to begin with, but believe me, we have a little bit, um, but just the importance of not just looking at conflict from the carnivore's point of view and not just looking at the impacts ecologically, but trying to make sure that we work very closely with the communities to understand what are the human dimensions in this conflict that we can address because it's the only way forward. So there are many more things. We have lots of things we talk about endlessly, but I'm very keen to collaborate, develop ideas, work together with you guys, anyone else who's interested. And we look forward to the next 10 years and more, hopefully, of scaling up work in Ruaha and beyond. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I feel I threw a lot of you there. <laughs> mm. Any questions, five minutes, and then we can go to lunch? What do you think? Yeah, OK, yeah. We had a brief discussion beforehand. And, um you know, I come to Colorado after having spent 10 years working in a similar field, directing the, the very big research done as a very involved with our approach. And, and yeah. I'm actually stunned at how much, how many of the problems we had and have have been solved by what you just said to me. And the point system for camera trap images is, is extraordinary. I don't know why in 10 years I didn't think of that. But <laughs> I think that all the time when things are being asked, why did I think of that five years? No, and then the, in 10 years, the convergence, I think what you're saying about the, the language of theory, anthropy, the occult of witchcraft, mm. is absolutely essential if you're going to look at community attitudes to lions. The lions aren't just lions, they are also humans in the condition yeah. of witchcraft accusations. Yeah, yeah. And that's been a major factor, a major factor in the way we've dealt with things. Yeah. But the big difference, I think, between South Africa, where I've worked, and uh, Tanzania and East Africa generally, although there is a convergence now, 
is in increasing fragmentation in East Africa around fencing yeah. and existing fencing in South Africa. Yeah. To what extent is fencing an issue in, in the conservation? Is it encroaching on the kinds of areas? It's really not at the moment because all of Tanzania's national parks are unfenced. So that has been the major reason why Tanzania is such an important place for wildlife because you have these huge contiguous landscapes. And we see occasionally that fencing is brought up as maybe the solution to conflict around Ruaha is fencing the park. But, you know, it's a massive park. The cost would be astronomical. We've seen in Namibia and other places that fencing, you know, everything digs under it, pushes it down. You know, it's just it's not going to be the viable way of doing it. So I think the good thing also is that the scale we're working at almost precludes the fencing. Of course, in places like South Africa, where you have these small populations, it's easy then relative to fence them. And then you've got this real barrier between the wildlife and the people. And it becomes that wildlife, someone else's wildlife and my land. And I think that I would like to see more of the fences come down. I'm not a fence fan myself. Well, they are coming down in large, in, in large measure in parts of South Africa. Mm -hmm. We do have this entirely different legal principle of the ownership yeah. of the wildlife. I think so much of it comes down to the ownership. And that's where, and I, I worked for a long time in Namibia, and I thought that was the biggest strength that Namibia had, that people own their wildlife. You know, you own the land and you own the wildlife. And that fundamentally changes it, because you will look after wildlife if you own it. And much as we're trying to get here community engagement and ownership to some extent, it's not the same as them actually owning it and getting, being able to utilise it how they want. Whereas in, in Tanzania, yeah, you can own the land, but you don't own the wildlife. So in most places, it's just competing with what you can own, your cattle, your goats, everything else. I mean, it makes no sense. So I'm not sure what is the case in South Africa for what you can own. You can own it, can't you, the wildlife? To be what was called res nullius, anyone's property, and then uh, in 1993, and it had changed entirely. So animals on your property are owned, yeah. and you have then requirements for their defence. But I mean, yeah, it's, it's a very different situation. Yeah. Yeah. But the gender thing is just the last thing. I think your work in gender is really, really significant. And the, the shift in, in the status things, because that's really what we're struggling with. So. Yeah, definitely. I think the gender thing will be huge, and that's why I'm excited for the CSU link. That'll be really good. Thank you. Yeah. But I, I'll give you two complex wows and then ask a simple question. <laughs> One of the wows is, wow, you gave us a lot of things to think about after you talked about what the first wow of the good work you've done. seems like you've discovered a lot of the answers to your basic questions. The question is, your NGO, pride is NGO, correct? That scale is primarily funded by NGOs. Mm -hmm. How have you worked with governments and are you getting support from governments to kind of further this beyond just NGO involvement. Definitely, and that's sort of, I think that's going to be our next stage. So at the moment, it has been very much the standard NGO model, individual donors, philanthropy, organisations, other NGOs funding this sort of stuff. So it's kind of that small scale. But I think when we look and we're going to do our, pro our proper strategic planning for our project and also for Pride, hopefully, and that will really look at what is, how do we get to that next level of decision making with conservation, with, sorry, with governments that really sort of those people who set the policy. So that's, we're not quite at that league yet, but how do we get there to be recognised as having a seat at those tables rather than just the, the WWFs and all the rest of it, you know, given we're so small. But I think that smallness and that grassroots is something that we, we need to sell as a strength and say, we need to be talking to you because we're doing this stuff on the ground. We don't quite have the answer to how, but we want to get there. Can you talk just briefly about, um, for example, was it was it Mahinga that had the protected yeah, water yeah. hole and, and all of those dogs? Yeah. Um, talk about the, the interactions among the some of the Barabag groups or mm -hmm. some of the Maasai perhaps, and the governments that are in place at the local level that are recognized as legitimate by the, the government of Tanzania. And I mean, often pastoralists are, are regarded as the less yeah. desirable populations, yeah. as if, if yeah. there's recognition of, for example, that protected area and, and others like it. Definitely. I think that's been one of the key things that we've found the pastoralists is, you know, so marginalized, so disempowered. And they are seen very much and often explicitly as a waste of time, a waste of space specifically by the governments, the village governments, because particularly because they need a lot of space and that space is viewed as the open areas they need for rangeland. They aren't being used properly. and. And then on with the conflicts that happen with the farmers and the fact that to own land, you really need to farm it to have any rights. Over. All these things mean that the pastoralists have very much been you know, disempowered and marginalised. And I think it has been a shift because through the community camera trapping, particularly, it is the pastoralists that are really sort of maintaining that land and the, that are maintaining the, have any actions that mean that there can be more carnivores on the land. So the pastoralists are suddenly seen as actually they can bring revenue to the community and it encourages this sort of dialogue between them because the benefits are given both to the pastoralists and then the 
the obviously the sort of the herders but and the village leaders you have to have this dialogue so it's been interesting to witness that it's had an increase in sort of the dialogue at least between them and some understanding that we work primarily with pastoralists we're mainly there for pastoralists and the benefits to the villagers are coming because of that pastoralist relationship so I, I'll be interested to see how much if anything it's changed that perception of pastoralists but it might be another thing that would be good to see with these social aspects of how has it changed that feeling that the Barabag, I mean, their local name is Mangati, the enemy. I mean, do people still think of them as the enemy? Or has it in any way encouraged them to be seen as part of the village? And actually something we want to do in the next year or two is look at a conservation contract with the villagers where we very explicitly lay out what they can expect from us and what we could expect from them. And basically you end up, this has been tested in Mozambique, but you put money on the table and you say, look, every time you do something positive, like you reinforce a boma, you do whatever, you know, you, uh, you send your kids to school, we put money in the pot, but every time there is a lion killed, we take money out of the pot. So they can end up earning money as long as people don't do these things. And again, I think the pastoralists are there because they would be reinforcing their bomas, they would be doing it, they would be seen as the revenue generators for that. So I think it'll be very interesting to see how those dynamics change because it's complicated. Uh, on your range map at the very beginning, there was a, a spot that said not lion habitat. Or yeah. Um, that was kind of next to the park and next to the community area. Oh, so yes, yeah, so that was just, we were looking specifically at, so that was just bounded by the WMA. So how much of the, that was just about the land use. So there are lions that go out to that southeastern area, but that isn't really core lion heritage. Once you get past the WMA, it seems to be that once you're on, there's about 10 kilometers, I'd say, of village land where they're certainly there, but the amount of, at the moment, anthropogenic mortality and stuff is so much that it just, they start to, just die away effectively from there. And it's one of the things we want to do with our bigger scale camera trap. And we've got camera trapping grids up in different spots of the landscape. Look at what are the threshold rates there of human presence, livestock presence, prey presence, you know, that, that mean that, that carnivores can still persist there. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. What was down there that was yeah. different? At the moment, it's two things. There's lack of water, and there's also an intense human pressure once you get just beyond that spot. So yeah, that tends to be more, I think, of an anthropogenic pressure. Is, that, is there a threat of that moving north? Or? Well, it's interesting because I think when you empower the villagers, and particularly with performance payment type approaches, whether it's community camera trapping or these conservation contracts, one of the risks is that everyone starts to move into the villages because then they, these are the places they can get healthcare and education, all the rest of it. So we've said to the villagers, we can't stop that, but you as a village have the right to decide who settles on your land. So if you don't want to split your benefits of 10,000 ways, then you get to say, actually, this area, we're going to restrict immigration. In this area, we're going to make sure that there's only X amount of settlement. So they have to manage that. It is always a bit of a risk of that. But I think, I think that's up to the village governments. We can't control that, really. I just want to thank Amy again, of course, for being here with us. And I also wanted to briefly thank Captain Stoner and Mike Manfredo, our department chairs, for sponsoring our series and helping us with the support and resources. Thank you all for being here.